Let's draw a bird with an open mouth. Let's start just by thinking about the bird's skull. There's the cranium, which is the part that has the brain case in it. The eye fits into the side of that. And attached onto that is going to be the bird's bill. There's your simplified bird skull, little nostril hole here, right there. Now, the lower bill attaches back here. And there's a little bump that comes down and wrapped around that is your lower bill. So that when this bird opens its mouth, it hinges from this point back here. So we swing down from a point right back there. <clears throat> and in addition to that, there is, I'm going to get in here and just erase this bit of bill. If I put skin on this, there is a piece of stretchy skin that goes from this corner here down like that. So you're not seeing this as a void. What you're seeing then is a bird beak like that. If I put some more feathers on this, What? Now, couple little nuances in this. Some birds, particularly birds which are have big seed breaking beaks and ictirid birds. So those are the North American blackbirds, not the blackbirds for Raybonto and Valters. But on the, in the United States, our blackbirds, um, the Ictirids, metal arcs, those are blackbirds and um, seed eaters will have a kind of an interesting angle in the bill. So I'm gonna put a kind of more of a seed breaker bill on this bird. And what you get is when it gets right back here, there's this change in the angle of the bill right here. There's a very sharp corner. So if this is a seed breaker, we'd have a bill like that. Um, if I am drawing a blackbird, then it is more like that. But both of those have this, this change in the angle of the, the, the bill right there. So that means our lower bill is going to be coming down here. And so if this bird opens its beak, what? you get this sort of a thing. And the little flange of skin comes back. So you're going to actually see, you're going to be able to see this corner here and the bump there.
So most of the movement when we open our bill is from this point here. There is actually a small amount of movement that you get in this part of the bill. And on some birds more than others, you get a little bit more movement right there. Um, and that allows the bill to slightly tip up. So you'll see on a begging chick, very often with its mouth wide open, this upper bill will be slightly tipped up. Parrots also um, have some flexibility in, in that and can move their upper bill. But most often what you're going to be seeing is that the movement is happening from just dropping the lower bill down, not this what's called cranial kinesis, this flipping of the upper bill up. That's a rather subtle thing and it's kind of a, atypical. So don't, what you don't want to do is to say, all right, here is my, my bird and it's singing. So you see there's two big problems with this bird's bill. One is that the upper beak has really flipped up. The other is that it is the inflection point on it or is right here as if this is its pivot point. Remember this lower beak, it's pivoting way back here. So you get this little gate. So don't do the So that's it opening its beak in profile. To make this a little bit more interesting, let's take this bird and turn it just ever so slightly towards you. So what I'm going to do is we're gonna draw a singing bird, but instead of it turning to the side, it's going to be turning in this direction. Oh, and one other thing. Very often you will see that the upper beak part is pointed up in the air, but that's not because this bill is tipping up. It's because the whole head is turned up like this. So uh, just one more drawing before we do the three quarter view. Um, it's gonna be very often a singing bird will tilt its head back And this bird, I'm gonna puff its throat out a little bit because it's just singing up a storm. So here you notice that the whole head has been tipped up. And it's not that this part of the beak has flipped up. The whole head has tipped up, not upper beak flipped up. Now, <clears throat> let's draw our little bird friend, head tipped up, three quarter view. So um, the head angles, we're gonna kind of come in here. So there's the far side of the head below the eye beak line, the head kind of flares out. That's where the sort of the ear patch is. So in this area here from the front, the head flares out below the level of the beak, the eye beak line. So that's why we're seeing this flare out there. This is where your beak is going to attach. Your eye is sitting up on top of this line here. And now we want to draw this bird, give it a little bit of a nape bump here. We're gonna draw this bird with an open beak. All right, so um, my beak is going to
Start just thinking about one side of the beak. So I have this side of the beak here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, since we're, this bird's head is tipped up slightly, I'm going to imagine that I'm seeing a little bit of the underside of the beak here. And I'm gonna be seeing a little bit of the underside of the upper beak in there. So sometimes you will see their little tongue flicking up. So the, the tongue, um, think of a, a little skinny snake-like thing with a kind of big kink in it. So sometimes when it's open, you'll see the tongue kind of like ear, ear, kind of sticking out like that. Or sometimes the tongue can but the tongue, it's this little pointy thing that fits in that bill. Sometimes that kind of kinks up and you'll see a little bit of that tongue. Let's draw one more bird with an open beak, right down here. This one, I'm really gonna tilt the head up. So here is, I often will think of just sort of drawing the side that is closest to me. Here is that, this is the part of the body called the lores that comes in before the eye. Put a little bit of lines around my eye, those little feathers that sometimes make the bird look sleepy. Here's our mallard area, whiskers, right? Um, and my, my beak ends here. So I'm gonna be actually seeing part of the head wrapping around the other side here. So notice how on this one, this side of the head, here's the middle of the head here. You're seeing a little bit of head tucking in here. So the same thing's gonna happen on this. If I do it, if I draw the edge of my head here, that's not gonna look right. I want my head wrapping around where that beak comes in. First do the far side of the head and then the close side. Whoa, it looks like I've got some crazy cranial kinesis happening in here. Doesn't that look kind of flipped up? Yeah. I think I need to I find it does really kind of help me very often to write on the top of the forehead. I put in a little tick mark where the middle of the head is just to help me kind of keep track of that line there. 
So, because sometimes actually the feathers, these feathers here will be coming together, they will make a little mark up there. And that just helps you kind of keep track of where the center of your bird's head is. <clears throat> That's a little bit on birds opening their mouths. Another question that we had um, was, how do you handle small birds in flight? So um, I am working on a class on large raptors in flight, and that's going to be a full Thursday workshop. Um, so I don't want to, um, we will kind of get to that there. And there, you know, you're actually drawing what you see in the wings. But the problem with drawing a small bird in flight is that the smaller the bird, the faster the wing beats. And so if you look at a sparrow go across your yard, um, the wings are doing that. And then, hey, draw my hand, okay? Yeah, draw my hand. Good luck on that, right? It's not gonna happen. So the same thing is true if you're drawing the bird and its wing is doing this, you know, like how are you gonna draw like these, or what are the primaries doing? What are the secondaries doing? You can't see it. So my general advice is that if you can't see it, don't draw it, but draw what you see. So let's say there's a little birdie here. I'm gonna draw a little bird in flight. First, we're gonna just do a side view. So here's the head, here is my body. Here is my upper tail coverts, all right? So my back is coming here. My underside is gonna be, have more angles on it. So where the head meets the body, kind of come down in here, some belly feathers, then up into belly feathers come up and then hit these under tail covers, which is sort of a triangle of feathers on the top part of the body. So this is sort of a generic, flying bird shape. And then the tail feathers are going to go into these covert feathers here. So there's be some little covert action above and then a, another covert action right down here. The wings attach from here to about in here. So that's where if you took a sort of sliced off this wing, there would be the cut right there. Not that I recommend doing that to birds because they don't like it. That's where the wing is gonna attach. And then it's flapping this way here. So um, what people think that they have to do is to somehow freeze frame this bird. But if it is doing flap, 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 then what you get is actually a blur right in here. So what I'll do is, you know, here's, here's a little Junko flying away from me. Here is its, its head. Um, here's its upper tail coverts. Here's its tail. Oh, um, Jack, could you please? Oh, oh, thank you. So I'm just drawing a little kind of Junko body here flying away from me. And here's its little tail. Junko is a little sparrow like thing. So um, what you're what you're going to get is um, out, out here is a blur and out here is a blur. And so I'll just put in little blurs because I can't see all the details of what's going on there. And so how does, um, you know, here's, here's, here's a little drawing of a wren flying by. Um, I'm gonna have a little wrenny head.
slight underside view. And that is, that's more accurate than trying to draw, you know, you know, I think that I should be seeing something like this. Because now doesn't it look like my little wren is soaring? When really what you see with the little birds is just the blur. So I just draw the blur. Um, reminds me, I think I may, if I can quickly find, hold on one second. Sort of remember, oh, <laughs> yeah, check this out. All right, so this is a book with an odd title. Um, here is Birds by Character, The Field Guide to Jizz Identification. So uh, jizz is the term that British and European birders use for gestalt, uh, meaning sort of the general appearance of something. What's fun about this little uh, British bird guide, uh, first of all, it is by just this like A team of illustrators. Um, crazy, crazy cool illustrators that they brought together to create this little book. Um, and, uh, but they've look, look at, look at this, <laughs> check this out. Look at this guy. I'm going to zoom down on this because this is, this is a masterful little illustration right there. Look at that blur, that razor bill coming in that upper wing. The one that's closest to you is just a total, just series of vertical blur kind of graying out, right? And then that lower bill, you're kind of getting a, the lower wing, you're kind of getting a little sense of it. But that first one in front of you is just a big blur. Love that little, that's a, that's a perfect way to handle that little drawing challenge. Um, look at this little guillemot doodle right up here. I love those feet sticking out. Wow. Right? But you get that sense of this, that, that blur of the wing. Let me see. Um, and there's there's a few other birds where they, they, they did this. I think my recollection is that the dipper in this book, see like larger birds that will stick their wings out in, in, in flight, they get the wing drawn, right? Um, but for the little ones, let's see what they did for the dipper. Because dippers, you know, 121, I think one. Oh, <laughs> look at the wren drawing. Uh, th look at this. Uh, wait, where is it? Find the wren. Up oh, there. There we go. Look at this rendering. All right. Isn't that cool? Hey, look at that's so Renny. That's so Renny. Right? And so this is this is the real Ren Ren. Um in uh, here we've got you know the house Ren and all these other different sorts of Ren, winter Ren. Um, but in Europe they've got the Ren. So this one is called the Ren. Right. So there it is. There's just this there, you're seeing this little vertical blur. And check out their dipper. So European dipper, it's got these brown and white patterns on it. So instead of being gray like North American Dipper, look at this little Dipper drawing. It's just a blur. Isn't that neat? That's such a great solution to those fast flapping. I like this little begging chick down here. Like, I want some, I want some, I want some. So that's um, for somebody who is um, a really small bird. That's your best approach. Um, for birds that are a little bit larger, 
you actually will see um, the shape of the wing. So don't do this if you can't see the shape of the wing. Um, but if you can see the shape of a wing on a bird, all right, uh, you know, here is my little head. I like kind of blocking in the body first. There's upper tail coverts. And then those go out onto a tail. And if I'm looking along the back of the bird, so the back of the bird is right there. Um, if I'm looking at the back of the bird, very often this wing that's on the, uh, the wing that's on the side closest to you, sort of attaching in here, you're going to see that kind of coming out. Think of it as a sort of rectangle for the secondaries. And then you're, from there, you're kind of going into that fan for the primaries. And so I'm gonna put a few little kind of feather indications there at the start of that. Um, but because these are sort of flappy, don't get to get too into like drawing every feather. But you can <clears throat> um, simplify it with, let's say this bird has a wing bar or two wing bars. Wing bars are up there in the secondary coverts. Then here in these parts of the feathers, I will sometimes just sort of make these lines fan and those other ones come straight in. And that is going to attach onto the side of the bird. Don't then do the same thing sticking up here. Because very often in flight, if this thing is coming towards you, if I've got a wing that's kind of coming down like this, this wing is going to be coming down like this. That means that if you're looking at it from the side, this far wing is kind of tilted down out of your view. So if you are observing this from over here, you're seeing all of this wing, but you're seeing this wing here in a very foreshortened view. So what I'll often do is foreshorten the wing on the far side. So here is my far wing. And if that wing tip was down even more, you can get cool shapes like this. So that's really foreshortening that wing that is out on the far side of the bird. That's if you can actually see bits of wings that are um, bits of, of, of wings that are, 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 are flapped out there. There's a big tendency to draw it this way. All right, let's say you had your bird body, bird head. I'm gonna draw that, here's the center line, upper tail coverts. All right, so there is, there's a, let's zoom down on this. So there's my little bird core. There's a tendency that we have to want to draw, I'm gonna draw again, here's my secondary feathers. They're gonna be in this part here. My primary feathers, the leading edge of it may come out straight like this, or it may be rocked back. 
depending on what part of the stroke it's in. And typically, um, your longer feathers, it's not this first one, it'll be one of these after that, and then they all kind of come in the same length. So what we tend to want to do is to do this. Again, flipping this up here. So I'm drawing the same thing. Right. And you see how it looks like somebody's just taken this far wing and er, turned it towards you. We want it for shortening down. So that's why I really think about this back wing instead of being up like that. It's rocked away from me. And if this is the angle that I'm seeing the tail, then the wing tip is going to be parallel to that. So the wing tip point is going to be out along that line. So I'm going to have my wings start out here, go to a wing tip point there. I'm going to erase this little belly line so it doesn't get in the way of my that that's just making that back wing foreshortened away from us. And birds can do all sorts of crazy dynamic things with their wings in flight. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, if it, 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 it's it's possible that you know when you're when you're drawing a bird, you know here's here's a bird and it's doing. Uh, let's say this is going to be a barn swallow. I'm gonna look up at this one. Let's see, do I want to be looking at the belly of? The, I'm gonna look at the belly of this thing. I'm gonna think of a barn swallow looking at it from underside. So here is the undertail coverts coming in here. Here's the line of the belly here. Here is our head. But wings can do all sorts of crazy dynamic things. Um, so I'm going to put in a little bit of our tail here. Um, so the wing could be doing something kind of not very interesting. Uh, barn swallows, the primary feathers are really long. And the secondaries are fairly short. Um, so I, I could have, you know, just something a wing out like this. I also, you know, birds birds will do all sorts of crazy stuff. So it could be taking its wing, and then it's turning it this way, and it, then it's sort of flipped down towards us. Oh, Jack! And uh, could you oh, please? Oh, 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 there we go. I lost my bird. Thank you. All right. And the other one is coming down like this, and you're just seeing its shoulder here, and and its its wing is then popping up. You know, if you look at high speed photography of birds in flight, the wings are just twisting and turning and doing all sorts of crazy dynamic, aerobatic things, and they they get away with it. So, but sometimes we will overdo our symmetry. Um, um, as we are, as, as we're, as we're drawing those, those birds. Um, but just be aware that you can get away with all sorts of 
asymmetrical things because sometimes you know your bird and you're doing some weird turn and then you go for it, little bird. All right, let's take a look at that list. Um, so there's a question about colors and colors turning muddy on you. Um, and this is a, this is a really, really interesting um, question. I'm gonna use watercolor to answer the question, um, but I could also do the same thing with, um, with looking at, with, with looking at colored pencils or acrylics or gouache. The reason that colors turn muddy is that if you have all of the three primary colors in the same place at the same time, well, let's actually do that. Um, so I'm going to get my um, magenta. So magenta, um, actually maybe this requires just a little demo here. Um, if you haven't heard me go on a tirade about magenta and red before, um, the, uh, this, is, this is magenta. Um, this is my co color I'm looking at here is Daniel Smith's quinacridone pink. Um, you also could have uh, uh, Winsor Newton quinacridone magenta is another good magenta color. The quinacridones, they've got some great magentas. Um, I want just everybody to, without kind of going into the full thing, just look at what happens when yellow meets magenta. There's yellow, there's magenta. Would you agree that neither of these are red? Good, we're all in agreement. All right, I'm gonna get these two together and they make a beautiful orange, don't they? Okay, you kind of saw that coming. But look at what happens when I get this yellow up into the magenta more. I just turned it red. All right, let me give myself a little bit more magenta so I can get a darker, more intense color here. I'm gonna bring a little bit of yellow, maybe not that much. There we go, into that. All right, we can make red. You can mix red out of magenta and yellow. And so um, red is not your primary color, magenta is. Red contains magenta and it contains yellow. So if for instance, I, um, I mix a purple by taking a, um, also let's, let's actually do this for, let's, let's play with blue for just a second. So I've got some blue here. Um, with the standard theory, I take red and blue and I put those together. Oops, sorry for being off screen. I take red and blue and I put them together and it makes purple. So yes, this is eh, purple-ish, but it's also kind of a dull plum color. It's a dull muted purple. Um, on the other hand, if instead of using um, blue and red, I use the color cyan, which is more of this sort of tealy thing. And magenta. And these two come together to play. I get all sorts of much more vibrant purples. So look at red and blue makes dull purple, cyan and magenta make bright purples. The same is true with green. If I take 
blue and I mix it with yellow, I will make a green. But the question was about why are my colors turning dull? Let's look what happens when these two meet. Okay, there's a green. And so you're saying to yourself, well, all right, that's green. Colors mix the way that, that, that they should. This will not look dull green to you, to you until I put next to it what happens when I put cyan together with yellow. Let's do that right now. So right now you're thinking, yeah, that looks, that looks pretty legit, all right? So here is cyan, again, this sort of tealy color. And I'm going to mix that with yellow. I just did the thing I tell everybody not to do. I just got some cyan in my yellow. All right, so here's yellow. This comes along and it meets cyan and look at how they play together. Isn't that interesting? See that green that we had above, this didn't look dull until you see this next to it. This looked like purple until you saw this next to it. So the take home here is that if you are using blue and red and you're mixing in those in with other things to kind of match your colors, you're getting dull colors. And the reason is that red is the result of the combination of magenta and yellow. And blue is the result of the combination of cyan and magenta. If I get, let's say I've got my cyan and yellow here, I have a bright green, let's see, I'll get this back on the screen. Let's say I wanted to make this more dull. What I would do is just put a little bit of magenta into it, a little bit. So it's mostly cyan and yellow, but it's gonna have a little bit of magenta. Let's see if I can put a little bit of magenta and make it something that's closer to this color. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna just take a little bit of this and I'm gonna mix it in here. You see that getting dull in front of your eyes. A little bit more magenta. So by putting magenta in there, I have made this a duller green. So what I've done is I've, anytime you get all three of those primaries together, you're gonna to be making your colors duller. Two primaries, colors are bright. Three primaries, colors turn dull. Let's take this bright purple and mix a little bit of yellow into it and make it dull. So I'm going to just do the same thing, get some cyan. And some magenta. Bring those together and make a bright color, All right? Really bright, depending on the amount of these other colors that I put into them, I can mix that into all sorts of different kinds of, 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 of purples. But again, over here is this dull, very dull um, purple. It's dull because it has three primaries in it. In the red, there's yellow and magenta. In the blue, there's cyan and magenta. That means red, yellow, I mean, sorry, magenta 
and yellow and cyan are all mixing together in the same place. So if I just take a little bit of yellow, not too much, and I mix it into this, I will make this into a dull purple. My paper's kind of beating up here. But as this starts to dry here, we're going to see that this is going to, this is turning dull purple right in the middle of that bright spot. So one way to get your colors not to be as dull when you don't want them to be dull is that when you are mixing colors, first of all, don't use red and blue as colors to, um, don't use your red and blue as colors to mix, um, to, 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 to mix and tweak things because you'll be making everything dull. Tweak and mix with cyan or yellow or magenta. So the um, yellow that I'm using here is Hansa Yellow Light. The color I'm calling cyan is thalocyanine. Um, usually comes by the common name of phthalo blue green shade. I know you're saying it's got blue in its name. So why aren't I just calling that blue? What you really want to do is blue is a useful term. And what most people think of blue you know, navy blue, royal blue, is, is a blue. So it's a combination of magenta and cyan. You do want your brain to hold cyan in a special place. You want to start seeing and noticing cyan when you see it. So you, can, you look at a color, you want to get your brain to the point where it looks like at a color like this and you go like, oh, that's a lovely cyan, instead of saying that's a lovely turquoisey blue. Right? Um, you want to see cyan around you. Similarly, you want to start seeing magenta. See magenta. Look for things. Don't call magenta light red because it's not. Um, light red, let's take red and dilute it. Look at light red. Light red is a totally different beast. And there's nothing that you can add to red to turn it magenta. You cannot mix magenta from red. So um, a long time ago, it was hard to manufacture really good color fast magentas. We got colors like opera, right? And opera is this um, beautiful pink color, but the minute sunlight hits it, it turns yellow gray. And so professional artists would not use those magentas because if let's say you were commissioned by the Duke to create his portrait, and you do, but you use these fugitive colors that change color over time. You draw a beautiful Duke. You give the Duke, your patron, this painting. He puts it on his wall. He gives you uh, some, some money and you're his friend. You get invited to a party. And next month you will go by the house, uh, by the estate there. The Duke is looking at you kind of funny. And two months later, the Duke is coming for you because your portrait has just turned him into this jaundiced, weird monster, right? So it's not going to end up well for you. So anybody who's going to be displaying their art, they didn't use these fugitive magentas. And as a result, um, the closest thing that they, close to that, I mean, red is kind of in there. So people were doing their mixing with um, red and also um, mixing their, their red, yellow, blue. This red, yellow, blue triad 
we hear about it everywhere. My daughters grew up with the book, little, you know, mouse paint, where the little mice dance around in buckets of paint. And, you know, they make, you know, like they, they, they dance in the blue paint, they dance in the yellow paint, they make green paint. They dance in the red paint, they dance in the blue paint, they make purple paint. And the, and the mice just have this great party. The only problem with mouse paint is when you take the color that they are showing for those pools of paint and you mix them together, you cannot create the secondary colors that they're showing you on the page. Mouse paint lied to us. Right? So if anybody out there wants to redo mouse paint, do it with cyan, yellow, and magenta. Right? The world will be a better place. Um, so this is true for when you're mixing things with colored pencils, whatever medium you're using. If you're mixing with red, yellow, blue, your colors will turn dull. One last word, though, in defense of mud. There's nothing wrong with having dull colors in your painting and in your palette. A lot of things in nature are dull, and that's good. That's fine. So if you're drawing something that's dull, you can use those dull colors. When you want to make something bright, be aware of this red, yellow, blue triad. So if you look at my, my paint set, only three colors on this are really true primaries, right? Right over here, you can see it's very well loved. That's my magenta. Over here is the phthalo blue green shade. That's my cyan. And over here, also very well loved, that's my Hansa yellow light. That's my yellow. So each of these, um, each of these, I, I've got all these other paints here because, you know, and I will often just be mixing these different things in here. But you notice on my palette, I have kind of, this is my area primarily for mixing yellow and magenta. So this area tends not to turn dull. I can have bright colors in there because it's primarily my yellow and my magenta. In this area, it's primarily my, um, this is where I mix all my purples and blues. So I'm using my cyan in here. I'm also mixing in some blues. So there are duller um, this, this, this can start to turn dull. Sometimes I get kind of dull goop around the sides of it. Um, yeah. But this is where I'm mixing all my blues. This is where I'm mixing my greens, my browns, and my grays over there. Oh, one trick for your palette. Um, your one rule of your palette is, well, actually two rules. Rule number one is you've got to have a cyan and a yellow and a magenta. If you don't, and a lot of palettes don't come with those colors. They'll come with the yellow. They will sometimes come with a good cyan under the name phthalo blue green shade, but they almost never come with a magenta and they will come with a red. So you have to put in your own magenta. The second rule is keep your yellow clean. Keep this yellow clean. So these other colors, they can get a little bit of gunk in it and they're fairly forgiving. Your yellow will not be forgiving. You want to keep your yellow clean. So to help you keep your yellow clean, over here in this yellow mixing area, right here, if you look carefully, I have a little pad of yellow paint. See that? That little glob of yellow paint there in the corner? And look at this. Over here in my green mixing area, I'm going to kind of get in here. If you look in this corner, Actually, underneath all this gunk, there is also a glob of Hansa yellow light in there. There it is. There it is coming out, right? See that little glob of yellow paint in the corner of my, my green mixing area. So when I'm mixing my greens and I want some yellow, I'm not taking my dirty brush and putting it in here. Oh, no, 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 never again, right? I'm taking my dirty brush and mixing it into this little yellow wad that's in the corner. So just put a drip of yellow into the corner of your green mixing area, perhaps in your yellow mixing area too, but not into your blue mixing area. 
um, and your cyan mixing area because that also mixing in when you're if you've got your magentas from purples and stuff in there that will then really start to muddy this area but I keep some in the yellow I keep some in the red mixing area and that helps me keep my yellow clean so that's a little bit about how to get brighter colors and also how to keep your own palette um, sort of to have a useful structure to it Again, separate mixing areas for different families of colors and a yellow glob and a yellow glob so that you can keep your yellow clean. Jack, just Those, one clarifying question. Yes. Um, is it enough to look for paint that's called magenta, like quinacridone oh, magenta? Good, good question. Um, unfortunately, no. Um, with... Um, I, I've found that when I'm kind of, when I look at, uh, hold on a second. So that's a great question. Um, and especially with colored pencils, it doesn't work that way at all. So what, what happened, I think with Prismacolor, they probably, they already had a pencil that was called magenta that was sort of this weird purple color. And, um, and then they realized, we need to have this true magenta. And so they came up with another color that they called process red, right? Process red is the printer's magenta color, the process magenta color for, um, so there's nothing red about it. It's, it's a full up magenta, it's not red. Um, so the printers, uh, printers like your, your, your colored printer over there on the table, it's got cyan, yellow, and magenta ink in it. And you put those together, those are process colors that make all the colors you see. So your printer wants to make red, it's taking its magenta and it's mixing it with some yellow and it gives you red. Um, so there is no such thing as process or printers red. The process colors are cyan, yellow, and magenta, right? So very confusing names. Um, so with colored pencils, true blue in Prismacolor and process red. Um, the true blue is their cyan pencil. Right? Um, with blues, phthalo blue green shade. And with almost all manufacturers, you're, you're, you're in where you want to be. Um, things, a lot of things get called magenta. A lot of things get called magenta. Um, with Winsor Newton, their um, quinacridone magenta is, is a good straight up magenta. With Daniel Smith, the best magenta I found for like mixing clear reds and purples, um, when I put all their paints side by side and see what makes the, is the best for mixing, I come up with um, quinacridone pink. There are some other people who do like their quinacridone magenta better, and then there's quinacridone rose, and I can't really tell much difference between that and a lot of their other colors. Um, but for me, the one I found works the best is quinacridone pink uh, in the Daniel Smith selection. Um, but not all things called magenta are a really clean magenta. People are, we, we need to be a little bit more rigorous about what we refer to as magenta um, and also what we refer to as cyan. So that was a great question. Are there any other questions on this topic area that we might be able just to, it would be a, an easy, fix right now, um, or we can also call this a wrap for the day. I think that was a good summation. Great. Hey, um, thank you for being with us today. This is your Nature Journal uh, workshop. Um, and I hope that some of these strategies today from your flapping birds to your gaping birds to brighter colors, uh, we had uh, uh, some insights into playing with those. I hope you'll join us 
um, next week, um, where we'll uh, perhaps be able to play with some of these, these other topics and ideas. Um, every Thursday, every Thursday uh, is a more of a formal workshop. Um, right now, we're in the middle of a botanical illustration series, and I want to encourage you to join us there. Um, and I, I hope that you had fun um, playing with these. To this, this next uh, Thursday, by the way, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at how we take geometric structure and combine that with twisting curling petals. We've had previous classes on both of those topics, and we're going to be uh, drawing an iris and looking at how we go about that. So um, if it's your first one, it will be kind of jumping into the deep end of the pool. Um, but know that there are, we have built up to that point, and you can go back and see some of the recordings of previous classes, and I hope that those are useful for you. And I hope that this class was both useful for you and fun. Now, I'm really looking forward to our little bit of journal sharing right here because we have had, uh, we just passed our Equinox. And I know that a number of people went out and got Equinoxy and um, documented. I'd love to see any Equinox experiences that, that people had, observations that you made. And um, the, uh, I'm going to remove my spotlight here. I am going to jump over to the gallery view. And if anybody wants to share something, just hold your journal up to your, your page. Right now, I am seeing um, Ray Bonto and Walters um, both have journals up. We'll start with Ray Bonto. We'll then move over to Walters, and we'll see what is happening in your journals. Uh, Ray Bonto, it's good to see you. I'm gonna... um, so first, um, for that question, um, I found that Conacaron magenta is a little more purplish than Pink. Mm. Oh, good. That's 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 very helpful. So they've got a little bit more, a little bit more cyan mixed into the mix there, making it yeah. hinting it towards the the purple end. I, I think that's that's right. Yeah. Um, mm. I found that in different substitute there will be a slight difference in um, perlin green, Windsor Newton perlin green. I mean, that's the substitute, perling green. Sometimes um, the same names are the substitutes. Mm -hmm. um, so perling green, winter Newton is slightly more bluish. Oh, interesting. OK. No, it's the other way around. Daniel Smith is more bluish. In fact. Daniel Smith is more bluish. And um, it's tinted more towards what in the Windsor Newton? Green. Well, more <laughs> greenish than. Um, Daniel Smith. Okay. That's good. Now, don't be fooled by the internet um, gradients. Uh, sometimes the scanning goes a bit wrong um, because when I looked at the um, Perling Green gradient, it was like black, just black. Yeah, it, it's it's weird when we when we look at colors shown on computer screens. Um, so, so first, imagine that um, imagine that we took a uh, a batch of watercolor. We put marks down on paper. We look at the dry cake of watercolor. It looks totally different than when we put the watercolor on paper. Now we scan the um, the image from the watercolor, and we put that on paper. And then you look at the scan on your screen. And the thing you now see on the screen looks different than the little piece that you have in your hand. And then you send that off to a printer. And they're now using, so on their screen, you're using red, yellow, and blue lasers, lights to shine at the screen to make all these colors. And then you take that color and you send it over to the printer. And the printer is now using cyan, yellow, magenta, and black ink to make all these different colors. And so there's a huge, do not trust any colors that you see on the internet. Do not trust any colors that you see in a book. The, to really know what it looks like, you actually need to get a swatch 
of that color. That's why Daniel Smith sells these color swatches of where there's little globs of paint where you can take their your, the paint and 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 test that. That's the best way to kind of get to know these these colors. Um, and for some paints, like usually there's a set of student grade paints and a set of artist grade paints, uh, such as Windsor Newton Professional and Cotman. Uh, mm -hmm. So sometimes the artist grade paints tend to have more colors than the student grade ones. Now I've found that uh, now you um now if you if you use only student grade paint. It's, um, because they're cheap, um, you might tend to get them. Mm -hmm. um, some primary colors maybe may, um, may not be there. Uh, yeah, some primary colors are not there, so you have to go for the artist grade for those. Yeah. 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 It, it's, uh, yeah, you're right. Very often the student grade paints there's much more kind of filler, the stuff that holds the paint together and less of the pigment. So you end up having to kind of mix up a lot more paint to get the same, try to get the same saturation with colors with the professional grade paints. You can much more quickly kind of go, just dip your brush in and go bloop and you're getting these vibrant colors. Makes it a lot easier to do. Yeah, true. And what are the maybe um, name, um... There may be a variation in name too in the same brand, uh, but in the student grade and artist grade. You're absolutely right. One of the best um, references that I've found for color and watercolor um, is there is there's a, a gentleman who has kind of gotten all of these spectrometry studies of all the different paints and very careful studies of which ones fade. Um, and is put up online for free, very detailed analysis of all the different brands of paint, all the different colors. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a dense read, um, but the, the website is handprint.com. And you go to their watercolor section on handprint.com. And you can find what I found is the best um, anywhere, including stuff that's printed in books and any other website. That's the best resource for side-by-side -side analysis of all the different brands of paint that are out there. Yeah, one of um, them is like, um, the closest one to magenta will, uh, on the student grade paints will be the, I forgot, permanent rose, yeah which is more of a rose color than, uh, yeah. And also as for Windsor Violet, they call it Windsor Violet in professional, but they call, but in um, Park Min, they call it Dioxys in purple. Yeah. And, and I think they in, in they call it dioxazine violet or something like that over on Daniel Smith's side also. Dioxazine is the pigment that is the, 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 the color that is in it. So I actually like, I like it when things are named for what they are. Um, I like it when they call, you know, um, you know, that if you ground up a tourmaline stone to make a paint, you call it tourmaline, you know, and that's cool. Um, so some of Daniel Smith's names, you'll see that things are named after what they are. Just on that, just be aware that um, if something says cadmium next to its name, that means, yeah, it has cadmium in it. And if you do just a short little search on the health effects of cadmium, you'll say to yourself, I think I'm going to permanently take all the cadmiums out of my palette because I don't want that person in general around me, all right? So life is too short to paint with cadmium. Um, it's like back in the day when people used to use lead in paint, right? Now we realize that's not a really good idea. Um, I've taken all the cadmiums completely out of my palette um, and the palette that I, I sell has no cadmiums in it. Um, so that's uh, for your own- um, so, uh, I'm sorry, what? 
Now, what's wrong with cadmium, sir? Um, so cadmium is a, um, it's a heavy metal. And I'm going to uh, just, I'm doing a quick search right now um, that uh, on um, health risks. Um, and uh, let's see if I can find more safety. Um, uh, so uh, if you just do a, um, a, a, a short uh, review of, of cadmium on, on any site, sort of looking at, at health risks, cadmium is one of six substances banned by the European Union's restriction of hazardous substances directive, which regulates hazardous substances and electrical. So there's, 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 there's lots of places where people are just like, ooh, cadmium bad. Um, um, cadmium exposure is associated with a large number of illnesses, including kidney disease, earlier arteriosclerosis, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, although, um, uh, so there's uh, it's just not something that is um, fun to be regularly exposing ourselves to. Well, but the Thing is, uh, does it affect you much if it goes on your skin? You definitely don't eat colors. That, 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 that's true. Um, so I don't know about it. That's a very good question. I don't know if it is absorbed through the skin. So if there's a dermal transmission of it. Um, but I would imagine that if you're eating your sandwich and you've got stuff on your hands, I end up kind of painting myself. Um, my, 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 my sock, or I'm going to grab my sock. Um, if you look at my watercolor sock, um, there is, by the time I'm done with a, a day of, of painting, you know, this, I've, I've, this has spent its day right up against my skin. And I don't know if, um, if that is, to, to what degree that is coming through um, my skin. Oh, by the way, I do want to point out, this is sort of, of course, SOC 2.0. Check this out, right? So if you want to, like, how, right, right, I just want to jump over here to the um, gallery view. Raise your hand if you use a watercolor SOC. Want to see, there's a bunch of us. Want to see how you can make your watercolor SOC even better? Check this out. Googly eyes. Mm -hmm. That's right, folks. You can put googly eyes on your sock. And then, and then what you can do is, and by the way, we're, we're looking into for the next Wild Wonder, if one of the things for the Wild Wonder kit is googly eyes for everybody's socks. So this is a possibility. We're trying to get some really responsibly sourced googly eyes because now anytime you need a full on rock and hand puppet, you've got, you're already carrying the sock. You're almost, th you're almost there. So this is, you know, now I'm sort of putting in sort of things that kind of, you know, what makes your like things that you must have in your nature journal kit. I now am thinking I'm finding a million and one uses for a, um, a a really fucking sock puppet. Um, yeah, that's one of uh, the probably the problems of Cotman paints. They've got almost everything is cadmium. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like um, cadmium <laughs> yellow hue, cadmium red hue, cadmium orange hue, cadmium yellow pale hue, cadmium. Red pale hue, <laughs> everything you know, is cadmium. Those students need a healthy supply of cadmium in their diet, right? So, yeah. Um, so it's interesting with um, with the you know things like prang sets, um, really, really, really inexpensive um, sets of watercolors that are made for kids. Um, those ones are. Um, those watercolor sets are designed to be eaten. 
So the, the most important design feature of watercolor kits that are sold to, um, actually what I can do is actually have this thing entirely narrated by the sock puppet. So the, the most important design feature of the, the kits that are made to, um, uh, for, for young kids are that you can eat the entire kit and, and not die. So they don't have cadmium in those. You mean like you can go like that and have it as a drink? <laughs> oh, yes, 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 you could. Or you can pop the little cakes out of them, right? And chew on them and make your teeth purple and not die. So for kid watercolor sets, that's the prime because the you know, I've, I've got two daughters and there was a stage that they tried by mouth everything around, right? So the, the kid watercolor sets, those are designed, um, they're, they're, their primary concern is we don't want to poison anybody. And so there's no cadmium in those. And then you jump up to student grade and there's like, you're now running into a lot of cadmium. But I'm just suggesting to everybody out there um, yeah, you, you, cadmium is, is one of those things that it's just, uh, it's like low hanging fruit to, um, reduce toxics in your art supplies is to stop using the cadmium. It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's an easy thing. It's, it's similar to, um, here in the United States, we have what we call the dirty dozen. And the dirty dozen are the, they looked at, you know, of all the plants that people regularly eat, what are the food crops that after you do your standard wash on them, still have large levels of pesticides on them? And so um, if you're thinking like, oh, organic would be nice, or it'd be nice to not have pesticides on my food, but I can't really afford to do that for everything. Um, this, when you take a look at the dirty dozen list, maybe somebody put that into the, the, the list. Um, check out the, the, the dirty dozen list. If you just were to, tr to drop, to, to switch to organic on those ones, the amount, the pesticide load that you would be ingesting on a regular basis drops dramatically. Because there's just certain foods that are high on them after your standard wash and others that aren't. And so every once in a while they change the list um, because they'll retest things. Um, but that's, it's sort of kind of going organic on the dirty dozen is kind of like removing the cadmium from your palate, right? It's an easy thing to do that where you kind of get a big bang for your buck. So thank you for those, those insects. Bonto, tell us if you've done any uh, recent illustrations um, or other things that you wanted to share with us, any adventures with pigeons? Wrens or other discoveries in the field. Ah, here we have today. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, sometimes I just go. Um, before I used to use pen. Now I decided to use pencil. See, inside this doesn't go jiggling in the field. Yeah. It wants more. And it's good to cross train. Sometimes pen, sometimes pencil. Play with them all, and you're cross training. That's great. Um, that's it for this one and my nature journal, guess what, started to use more pencil, um, right. um, even though it's spiral binding, I use glue and, and water. Nice. So, um, here, uh, I just went sketching pigeons, uh, pigeons, 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 and a magpie came up. Oh, what fun. Aren't those spectacular? And, and th there was this strange, crazy fan tail. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's really fun. That's really fun. I like the way you're, um, you're, you're focusing on the parts that really interest you. You've got the head in three quarter view of the magpie, and then you're interested in the shape of the tail and you do a little study focusing on that. You don't have to do a head to toe portrait on any critter that you find. That's, those are really good strategies. Yeah, they have a strange tail. Like they go like 
that and then it drops down and then there's another fork like thing and then it goes back yep that's cool good observation yeah. then i decided to sketch it uh, some more pigeons and the squirrel <laughs> <laughs> Now I saw these last time. Those, 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 oh, these are new ones. These are we, we yeah. new squirrel observations. Let's hold that up still closer to the screen. Let's check out the squirrel shapes. Yeah. The, the, the squirrel so, shapes. Um, this was walking. Yeah. Uh, I um so strangely it turned out to be the most detailed. Yeah. Uh, now, something I want to encourage you to check out is to check out the sketches, the drawings and wildlife sketches of Beatrix Potter. Uh, Everybody knows her as somebody who uh, wrote the Peter Rabbit stories, but she's also yeah, yeah, she's yeah. an awesome naturalist in her own light, in her own right. And she's um, she did actually groundbreaking work on mushrooms, um, and but also her just studies of local wildlife, the squirrels and the rabbits, the mice that were um, around where she was living are really, really interesting. You might want to check some of those out. This is cool. I will. Uh, so um, I just did a quick sketch and I did a bit of grass. I did the bottom with a gel pen and then I just decided to make up some fur on it to uh, to make it look uh, nice. fluffy even if i didn't see those uh, but uh, yeah it's there then do 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 uh, this was yesterday mm. so here uh, i just decided to color it all black and um hatch the planes. Oh, nice. So, here, one pigeon, uh, two pigeons came together. One pigeon wanted to peck the other and kept on chasing it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and, and then it, um, so I called it Pigeon Y, and this one. Uh, who was being pecked, I call that Pigeon X, so uh, so that I could um, tell the story better. <laughs> so then I did, uh, so Pigeon um, Y was chasing Pigeon X, time to time it was chased, uh, pecking it. And um, once it just, uh, head forward. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Pigeon X flew up on top of a tree. Mm. Yeah. And Pigeon Y flew off a branch nearby and just started flapping like that in the same place. Wow, what's going on? Pigeon Y? Yeah, it was just uh, flapping. I estimated the speed. It was like flapping, let's see, one meter per second. Uh, that's good. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So I saw a butterfly, uh, but I didn't get much of it. Um. Yeah, but. Hmm. And then I went back home. I peeked into the garden. The garden is closed, but I decided. But there's uh, the gap between a fen fence. I decided to peek into it. What did I see? Some stones, of course, and a, and a few trees, but a cat. <laughs> oh, fun. Yes, and the cat was just staring at me with its gr bri bright green eyes. Uh, it, uh, it stayed very still, which I quite liked. <laughs> um, uh, cats are always like that, very slow, careful, <laughs> still. Mm -hmm. And it was looking at me as if it wanted a portrait of itself. <laughs> And, yeah. and you it very kindly. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah, then it walked. Yeah. It's, uh, yes, I did it. Then it walked. It 
It crouched beside the fence as if it wanted to jump over, but it didn't. It just crashed like that. Kerplunk. So I did another Kerplunk. sketch of it. Uh, this is then no, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. We, we've got cats, house cats around us all the time. Amazingly good um, sources for practicing our mammal drawing, and we don't take advantage of it. And then we get out into the field, and you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a bobcat, and then like, how, how do you even begin drawing these things? If you take advantage of the the pets and the house cats around you all the time, you it'll teach you so much and prepare you for when you find wild animals in the field as well. Yeah, I also decided to do a head sketch over here. Three quarter an eye sketch. An eye sketch. Nice zoom in, zoom out. Um, yeah, and here it was crouching. It moved his, its head very slowly. Uh, once I'd finished this, it moved its head, so I drew it again. And it walked, and it walked like very slowly and carefully. <laughs> and yeah, here's a walking view. Here's another walking view. And it just sat down like that. Uh, yeah. That's, that's cool. And set the park again. And I just did a few, a pigeon. I practice birds in flight. <laughs> good. Very good. Very good. Oh, this is really uh, cool. Because it was the evening and they were all going home. <laughs> um, um, and then today, I did that. Um, I love how you take so, advantage of whatever nature is giving you. You've got pigeons around. You're really working the pigeons. You've got, um, uh, you know, house cat around. You're going to take advantage of that. Um, do what is there rather than, you know, some people will wait for a cheetah to come into their backyard. And until they get a cheetah in their backyard, they say, like, I don't really have anything happening around my place. But take advantage of what is there. And then when the cheetah does show up in your backyard, you've got practice, you know, handling whatever it is that nature throws at you. This is great. So uh, then I started sketching pigeons, uh, I mean, squirrels. Um, um, yeah, I, there were some pigeons. This one, had brown spots on its back, spots, um, with some black spots with it too. Interesting. And, Interesting. and black spots in the brown ones. Yeah, this would be also a great place for adding some written notes about those. Um, the yeah. written notes and the um, little sketches like this, they go so well together. Hmm. Um, now, then there was this, pigeon uh, which had its neck which had puffed up its neck mm -hmm. now the wind blew and it revealed it blew the fur and i saw white oh so the so the tips of the feathers were brown but the bases of the feathers were white and mm -hmm. uh, i mean yeah the base and i didn't get to see the skin yeah. mm, but yeah. the base uh, yeah I saw this strange pigeon too. It had turquoise on its neck. Oh, wow. That's a very distinct not, one. I think that one's going to show up again. It's not even iridescent. Oh, it's not iridescent, but it's just sort of a solid blue. That's so strange. Yeah, probably breeding. <laughs> um, yeah, so then I saw this. Well, I sketched it by the head. and. I noticed that when pigeons puff up, up their necks, each minute, uh, I mean each second, they sometimes just flare out their tails and then they bring it together and they put it out again, again uh, and put it out together, but they never put it out and spread their tails when the neck isn't puffed up. These are fantastic um, wildlife observations. And I want just to encourage everybody to just sort of notice wildlife is where you find it. Um, 
And you, in order to kind of get excited about something, you don't have to go out and find a species that you've never seen before, but can you get yourself to notice something new in the familiar? Get yourself to notice something about some local familiar things that you have never noticed before. And it gets you looking at phenomena and organisms around you in a really different way. This is really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Jack. Um... Yeah. Just saying, it, there's also a 14B pencil. Oh man, that's just, <laughs> it's like, what does it have? Just like tar dripping out of the tip of it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, once I even saw, I, I didn't believe it. <laughs> there was a 100B pencil, but I think that's just powder. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're, 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 we're probably just getting into marketing. It's sort of like with, um, that at a certain point, the SPF's ratings of, of, of uh, sunscreens become meaningless. And I wonder when you're kind of getting into it, like an 100B pencil, like, yeah, can you really tell the difference between your 99 and your 100? I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much for sharing that. Mm, yeah, I don't think there's any use of there being um, uh, 100B because 12B probably is enough. Um, Actually, um, I think uh, there's a harder pencil which might be soft enough for your liking, and it's called an it's it's above a nine B pencil, which is the bad news, which is extremely soft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's called a nine X X B. Um, that's that's some soft pencils. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm now going to jump over to Walters and see what is happening in your journal. Uh, Ray Bonto, thank you so much for sharing. And hey there. Hello. So, yeah, I just wanted to share uh, is this the new. Oh, oh, sorry? A shrike. Yeah, this I is a great, slice. great shrike. Oh, man. Oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. So tell us about this experience. These are the coolest birds. Yeah, the, the little, it's, uh, it wasn't a long ago that I discovered that they, the prey they catch, for example, lizards or uh, mice, they put them on these sticks. So like it goes stick, the stick just uh, of a cactus, for example, goes just through it, through them and they just peer the meat off. So. That's uh, that was really interesting to find out. But this was uh, just uh, I found one sitting uh, on the what are they called? The, the wire, the branch. Wires, wires. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, we were just going uh, out bird watching, and it just was cool to see this guy. And he was so cooperative. He was just sitting there, and when when he was kind of scared in the by the way, he just flew like 10 meters to the other side and just sat down there. So very cooperative. Wow, it's a very wow. cooperative bird. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and everybody look at that, the tip of the beak there. Um, you see that little hook on the, the beak here? So this is a passerine bird, so a perching bird, but it has a raptorial beak and it behaves like a raptor so it's out catching it can catch other birds it can catch um lizards insects as walters was saying that impales those on thorns spikes on barbed wire fences and um apparently it's a, a very attractive thing if you're a male um you just get a bunch of dead things and you stick them on wires and you sit around next to them and um, it makes you very attractive to the females who are impressed at how many dead critters you've got lined up on your fence. Oh, this yeah. is such a neat animal. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. So we were going further, and this is a northern lapwing. Uh, and it was very interesting to find out that uh, I never noticed that they have kind of a, like an orange rustic but uh, yeah. the end yeah. of them uh, is like also here you can see so very never noticed that before and also kind of uh, a rustic patch behind the white uh, white uh, 
mm -hmm. white face mm -hmm. mask. That that's quite a crest on that thing. That's cool. It's mm -hmm. also it's yeah. Not, this was this was very fun. The, the pied bird. The um, so that black and uh, gray uh, stripe, and then you are find another bird with similar sorts of of, of patterns. Yeah. Fun to get them both on the same day. Both have masks, like bandit masks mm -hmm. on them, yeah. And this was very fun. Uh, COVID. They, the, the, the distribution of birds, which are masked birds, um, has yeah. really expanded during COVID because it's just so much safer. Um, yeah. So birds that don't have a mask aren't able to do the social distancing, and so we don't really see them out their back at their nests. But the ones with masks can kind of go around and, and yeah. hang out. So that's why we're seeing so many more masked birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. And this was very fun. I noticed that all the birds were standing uh, like uh, they were facing uh, towards the wind. But this guy just kind of turned sideways and his little crest just went like crazy like, to the side. That was very funny. I laughed so hard. It was just oh. and he was like his crest went and he was like, what's this? And turned again <laughs> against the wind. So that was very fun. And then yesterday found another shrike so uh, this was the same species but a different location i've got shrike envy i love shrikes they're such just they're just fascinating looking birds i also really like the way you're doing these sort of different angles on the heads just a quick little sketch from the different different position so we're really zooming in and zooming out here you can see where the shrike is from an exposed perch, it's going to be able to, to catch prey and look for prey from up there on that exposed perch. And then over on the close-up view of them, you've got the bird head from the side, bird, bird from the front. Do you also do the thing where you kind of bounce around between those pictures where when it's looking towards yeah. you, you look on that one, when it looks to the side? Yeah, it's just because it, I did this just the head because it wasn't changing its body position. It just was turning its head. So there's you don't have to do the whole whole body. You just if the if the head angle just changes, draw the head. The whole the body isn't moving. The body was just staying like this, straight yeah. uh, towards me, and uh, I just draw drew the head. That's right. That's really yeah. Cool. That's really cool. And I uh, I also put up. Uh, the nest boxes that I was uh, talking about already so much. I'm just really excited about the project. So could it be, would I be able to share a few photos? Yeah. I'm just yes, yes, yes. very excited about the project. So Volk is it to make you a co-host here, uh, making co-host, here we go. Um, and you now should be able to share. Yes. So how many share. boxes in total do you now have? Um, I have, I built 20, but I am monitoring plus 25, so that 45 nest boxes are up for monitoring. So photos, I hope this works. No, nope. wait, I'm going to share my whole screen. Okay, start broadcast. Maybe it will be this one. So uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yes, yes, we were seeing yes. the nest box underneath a crew. Yeah. Yes, so this is a nest box for a uh, spotted flycatcher and wagtails. And uh, usually the wagtails nest in like uh, cliffs. And, uh, but uh, since we don't have any here, almost any cliffs by the rivers in Latvia. So we just put these kind of open nest boxes under the bridges. And this is very simple. It's just a, like a open box, as you can see. It's, uh, it just has a, an open front. So hopefully I put up, uh, I put up four of these. So uh, two by the river and uh, two for a spotted flycatcher in the garden. So both of the birds uh, might use it. So those are the nest boxes I built for the wagtails and flycatchers. And this right here 
is up oh, here is the nest box <laughs> for, uh, wow. for the hoopoe. <laughs> oh man, you rock. Yeah. That's cool. That's so cool. We're so proud of what you're doing. This is spectacular. So those are really, really fun. So here, uh, here with, I'm with the guy. He helped me. That's the wild just that I uh, go out with. And it's just that um, we put up, we put up the ladder. Then we kind of have to carry all the equipment up with us. So the screws and uh, the nest box and uh, the tools to take uh, to put the nest box on, and then we just kind of put it on and uh, they got some spectacular views right there. So this is just the view from a nest box that they have. <laughs> so the hoopoes are gonna have a hell of a view. So this That's is right. just another nest box. This is great. Yeah, this is great. And this is what everybody, what you're seeing here is this is what stewardship looks like. This is what it looks like when you fall in love with the world to the point that you care enough to change your behavior and do something proactive to make a difference. We're really proud of you. This is awesome. Yeah. So it's just the here you can see that there's just the number. So this is 9P. And the P stands for the name of the bird, which is Hoopa, and Latvian it is Puputis. So the P is the first letter. And we're gonna just put, uh, uh, put, uh, uh, so here just putting them on. We're, if they're gonna be uh, Hoopa as nesting, we're gonna put on color, ring, color rings on them. Mm -hmm. and see if they return to the same territories. Oh, that would be uh, cool to see. The young, if the young ones uh, return to the same territories every year, and it's uh, it, that's going to be a really interesting experiment. What, what so, a, yeah, that's that. As spring comes in, uh, you welcome spring by setting up this array of nest boxes for all the birds. So everybody, I want you to imagine all these birds um uh throughout um parts of, of of africa and um asia starting to migrate turn and move north right and Walters is out there in anticipation of that wave of birds coming up to him on um as the equinox comes getting out there and creating all of this critical bird habitat and yeah you know, the, um, we have, um, oh, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's spectacular to see. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, we, we also find, found, uh, we were walking with my dad through a forest and we found an owl nest box that has, that had been uh, dropped down from a tree, fallen down from a tree and we took it home. So, now I also have an owl nest box that is ready to go. I just need to set it up. Probably won't be any owls this year because it's uh, they begin their breeding season here in uh, March and long-eared owls even in late February. So, but maybe next year. So that's gonna that's also cool. be very interesting. That's nice. And also you can from that kind of get the blueprints of what, um, of how do you make an owl box? And I'll bet you guys would be able to reproduce that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Hey, thank you so thank much you. for sharing that. I'm, I'm inspired. Um, the, uh, in just a moment, I'm going to have to, to, to bounce, I'm afraid, but before I do, um, is there anybody else that wanted to share perhaps an Equinox moment um, or something from your journals? I'm going to jump over to Cindy. Cindy, we have basically one minute. Sorry to make it so short. Oh, you're currently muted. There you go. Um. I wanted to thank you. I've learned so much and the community has been great. I've learned so much from all of you. I started the end of December. I'm finishing my first uh, nature journaling book. 
And I started, I was one of those kids who was not the artist and everybody told me I couldn't draw. But I decided I would try. I hadn't tried watercolors till December 31st. And this is my first watercolors. And I have my hawk who was hunting that I was just enthralled with. And every single line on it is the same width. And um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and you gave me ways in. I, um, you can see from the early on, it was like all, all words. Um, but I wanted to just say that by doing this, um, I, you know, I've done my sketching and I saw my hawks and I've been following a couple hawks. Um, and it turned out the hawks, um, unbeknownst to me, I knew they soared over our neighborhood, but they come at about 10.30 oh. oh. every morning. And um, there's a pair of um, two of, well, there's two of them. One comes early, about an hour earlier, and then the other one flies in later, lands nearly, I don't know if it's on top of her or on top of the branch next. I've been take, I've gotten the camera out so I can see um, some of the um, things more close up even than I can see with the binoculars. But you gave me this ways so to see the profiles and wow. to think of different things. I feel like these hawks are friends of mine now. I spend so much time with them. Every morning I wake up, I look some, once I've seen them there at 7.30 in the morning, I even look in the middle of the night if I'm up to see if anything's going on. Um, but I found that they have their routines. And um, the other day I was out there for about an hour and a half and I could give you the whole rundown of it, but I know we're late. Um, so um, the, they went away and they came back. One of them came back and I brought the, that was when I first brought the camera out and I was taking pictures um, and I, it's a new thing to me. So I had it up and um, she only, uh, I called this one she because she was on the underneath when this other one flies in all the time. But um, she, um, uh, looked at, she'd been looking at me like for an hour and she'd flown away and hunted and she had come back and she was still looking at me. I mean, you can see in these pictures, oh, yeah. like the yeah. eye, it's like, right, looking down. So she's looking and all of a sudden I see her razor wings and she flies out and soars. And I thought, oh, she's going off. This is the end. Instead, she came over to the table. I was sitting at the little pic a little picnic table on my on my patio. And I'm only I'm in town, you know, I'm only a few miles from Boston. And she flew over my she soared over my head twice. And she flew away. And then she came back. And she soared even lower over my head twice. And I thought, hmm. you know, I, I have all sorts of hypotheses, you know, is she curious about me? Did she think I might have food? Did she think I was something that was, you know, a threat to her? Was she going to attack me? That kind of worried me for a minute. Um, or what am, I also wonder whether she's kind of irritated because the prey that she'd like to be hunting in my yard, all those rabbits and stuff, aren't out as much if I'm out. I don't know. So then she didn't come back, or the two of them didn't come back in the times that I was looking out. They could have been back there every day for all I knew. But today I saw them again, and it was the same pattern, same time of day. One comes in, stays, then the next one comes, flies in just briefly, um, and then that one goes out and hunts and pretty soon uh, the first one who's been there all day follows. And I've had morphological questions about her, like what I saw a big um, protuberance and I thought, oh, is this a muscle? Is this a bump? Is this a wound? And then I started thinking, is this her crop? Has she just eaten? Is there something in it? 
And so now when I watch and take the pictures, I'm drawing and trying to see and trying to figure out, I've seen them eat. Um, I assume it's the same birds, um, take a kill and eat it up on the top. And I'm gonna go back to the pictures of that and see after eating if the crop gets any bigger. So I'm totally smitten. The only problem I see with this whole community and you is that it becomes an addiction. I don't want to go do my work. <laughs> I, as, you know, I can't come inside. You've got to make this a priority because this is, I mean, just listen to you, Cindy. You are electric about this. As you happens, I can see your face just lighting up and I can feel your love and connection with these animals. And this journaling like this is a doorway to that kind of connection. And that's what leads us to be a steward like vultures, because we pay this kind of attention, we make that connection, and all of a sudden the hoopoo is, is, is part of the family within the sphere of your care. And I had always been a hiker, a walker, a camper, and always thought I was looking at nature but it was not until I started doing this and started really asking questions and going back to it and working and trying to draw that I actually saw as much as I see now, both in particular animals and the connection with them and with the number of species I saw. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading Bernd Heinrich and hearing him say, he would sit under a tree in his cabin in Maine and the Appalachian Trail hikers would walk by him and they would never see he was there. And I always thought, yeah, I can see that. I can see all that, you know, I'm missing and this has given me a way in. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. And thank uh, you to the whole community. Yeah, I'm just, it is a community effort here. And, you know, you're being willing to, to be vulnerable and share this experience with us also inspires the community. So we're delighted that you are a part of this. Congratulations on finishing your first uh, journal there. And that's right. It's a slippery slope. The uh, first journal is free. And, and then you're hooked. And then the whole world opens up before us. And um, welcome. Thank you. I thought it was about time I turned my video on and became a part and shared with all of you who've given so much to me. Well, we were delighted to meet you. And so on behalf of Vea, Brian, and myself, and the whole Nature and Journal community, we are so proud of you. And this is awesome. And uh, it's, yeah, and the adventures are just beginning. The adventures are just beginning.